Welcome to Eight Poly Tools with Journal Prompts. So this is actually a new class for me. I've done the poly tools in a variety of forms, but this is the first one with the focus of like journaling about these different tools. So I'm, I'm really excited about this one. Just a little bit about me. I'm just going to throw a little bit out there. I've been in a polyamorous and power exchange relationship with Daniel Bellum since 1999. A lot of years. <laughs> which is how I have a lot of tools because we were determined to uh, uh, make this relationship work. We've been presenting since about 2004, an average of 12 to 16 events a year, not counting the current online stuff, the events we've produced, the dungeon space we used to own. I mean, our life is kink and polyamory. Co-host of the Erotic Awakening podcast, since 2009, so it just hit its 15th anniversary. I think I am getting ready to post tonight episode 687. I mean, it, 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 there, there's a lot of shows. And then we are authors of a couple of books, including the Polyamory Toolkit and the Polyamory Dating Guide. A couple of disclaimers. I do use naughty language. It, it's just the way I talk. So it catches people by surprise sometimes. I don't know if they think I'm a soccer mom or what, but there will be naughty language. My pronouns are she, her, and I use the preferred pronouns of anybody in our polypod. These tools, I picked out eight that are going to be really good for journal prompts, but keep in mind that these tools aren't going to work for everybody. These are the tools that we came up with over the last 20 some years that work for us. Some work a little more for me than Dan, some work for Dan a little more for him than me. One of them that I'm going to share with you works really well for my partner's partner. She's the one that taught it to me. The other thing is, is that we teach, I teach from my experience. So this is, this is how it works for Dawn. And I'm a storyteller, so you're going to hear stories. That is, that's the way I teach. So 20 years ago, Dan and I had already started our polyamorous journey. We knew when we created our relationship that it was going to be something different. We were going to have a designer relationship. The word polyamory wasn't even really known at that point. But we knew that we were going to play with other people, have sex with other people, and have emotions with other people. So great. That's, that's a utopia way of fantasizing how our life is going to go. We're going to do this thing and everything's going to be great. And then jealousy hit us. And we were surprised. We, we really didn't think that was going to be an issue. We had thought it through, we had talked about it, but then when we started experiencing it, the jealousy hit. So we went to this event back in 04, and there was a class on jealousy. And we're like, oh, that's exactly what we need, right? Maybe they can give us some hints, some clues. Well, we went to this class, and basically all they talked about was how jealousy sucked. There was no tools. It was like, yeah, jealousy sucks. Jealousy has sucked through the ages. Jealousy will continue to suck. Jealousy sucks. And we left that class and we're like, we got absolutely nothing except that now it feels hopeless. That if we start feeling jealous, we're never going to be able to pull ourselves out of it. And we knew better than that. We are growth junkies. We are always about personal growth. And jealousy was our tool to start working on our our growth to design the relationship we wanted. So some of the tools I'm going to share with you, we wish we knew back then. Instead, some of them we've only discovered in the last couple of years. So we put it all in a book and we, we try to share this with everyone else. So anyone else that's experiencing jealousy or just trying to figure out how to make their polyamory work smoother. So they have tools to work with. So that's what I'm going to share, share with you tonight. A little bit about my polypod. I've been with Dan for over 24 years now. We are nesting partners, which means we live in the same house. For us, that means our finances are intertwined and we raised kids together. We have a granddaughter. We own this RV together, travel, present. We do a lot of stuff together, okay? So we are nesting partners. I am, I have another partner of almost 11 years, 
Oh, I just got to see him. I flew to New Orleans to see him. He is also a full-time RVer and was never knows where he's going to be at. At least we're scheduled a little bit because we follow the events we teach at. But he never knows where him and him and his wife are going to be at. They get behind the wheel of their RV and they get to a stop sign and then decide which way they're turning. So the fact that he was going to be parked in New Orleans for a couple of days meant I could fly out and see him. And he was in New Orleans because his wife was going on a cruise with her other partner. So it was just kind of a, a neat polyamory moment. Anyway, so that's me. I have Dan. I have another partner of 11 years. I am open for more, more partners. Dan has me, and then he's got two other partners, but they're both long distance as well. One's in Chicago, one's in Phoenix. And that's just the way it's going to be at the moment because we're on the road. So he's been with them for a couple of years at this point. I think we're going to park out of Chicago. Usually we move every two weeks, except in the winter where we've parked here in Yuma the last two years. But I think this summer, we're going to stay a couple of months up near Chicago, which is near his non-Phoenix partner. So that's going to be pretty neat. We have had other boyfriends, girlfriends, all kinds of combinations over the last 20 years. So two more words that I might use during this class. I'm just going to throw those out there and then we'll get started. Compersion is one of those words. And for me, that's one of my goals is compersion. And compersion is a made up word, like a lot of made up words. And it just means the joy you have from your partner having joy, okay? And usually that means, usually the way people use it is joy in their partner having love for another partner, having sex with another partner. It's usually those volatile things <laughs> where we usually feel jealousy. If you feel the opposite, that's compersion. And then I may say metamor, and metamor means partner of a partner. I may say meta or metamor, partner of a partner. And this is just high level definitions. Nesting partner, I already went over. That is just somebody that you live with. Okay. Now, for us, our polyamorous journey, we actually started out co amorous. And co amorous means that we dated as a couple. And we literally did that for 10 years. So when we first started into polyamory, like I said, polyamory wasn't even a known word. It was still kind of new. So we came at polyamory through the swing community and through the kink community. And in the kink and swing community, it's especially the swing community, it's perfectly normal for a couple to date a third or a couple to date another couple. So that's how we came into it. That was the easiest way to find people. Like I said, 10 years. We did that. So there wasn't much reason for jealousy. You know, we, it was pretty safe. It was us dating someone else or us dating a couple. So no real reasons to trip that jealousy. Then we started to date a couple and Dan fell in love with half of that couple. And I did not fall in love with the other half. And we were friends. We got along great, but he thought I was a dominant and I thought he was a dominant and neither one of us were, and it really did not work out well. He's a cutie. He's still a friend, but not polyamorous partners. So we had to have that discussion because we had that agreement of, well, if all of us aren't in love, then we'll break up and it's not going to work. But he had fallen in love and he's like, mm, we need to have a conversation. So we talked about it. And we decided, being the growth junkies we are, that we were going to start dating separately. Very hard. And that means the jealousy started 10 years into our relationship. Now, I do have a soapbox around jealousy in that once a lot of the mainstream, non-kink, non-swing polyamorous groups, there is a belief that if you feel je jealousy, you can't be polyamorous. And I like to throw out there that jealousy is just another emotion. It's what we do with it that matters, right? So if you are polyamorous, and one of the first journal prompts that we're going to look at in just a second deals with this. For some of us, we're polyamorous because we're polyamorous, regardless of the emotions around it. 
doesn't matter if you're jealous, just figure out how to work with it. It's not good or bad, it's a tool. Oh, never mind. I do have a second thing. Jealousy does not equal love. A lot of us have been taught that if we truly love our partner, of course we're going to be jealous. And I had to learn how to deconstruct that because sometimes I would feel jealous and not know why. And I learned over time to sit there and go, wait, wait a minute. Am I feeling jealous because I think I'm supposed to feel jealous? If I go to my vanilla friend and say, man, I'm just having this jealousy problem, her reply to me was, of course you're jealous. Your husband, the person you love, is dating someone else. And I'm like, oh, so is my jealousy a construct? That's something to think about, right? Maybe it is, maybe it's not. All right. The other soapbox I get is when some people say, that they believe you're poly because your partner's not enough. I literally had a friend tell me that I drove Dan to polyamory because I wasn't a happy person. And then we had to deconstruct that as well because Dan is polyamory because Dan is polyamory. It doesn't matter what partner he's with. It's not about his partner. It is about him. Okay. So that is that was a good thing to learn because some of us, regardless of what we think or, or what our logic tells us, sometimes emotionally we can feel like we're not enough. Why is our partner polyamorous? You know, that whole, a whole lack of self-esteem things. So that would be going on. All right, so with all of those little stories, let me try to make polyamory a little easier for you, okay? So I'm gonna share some tools. They're all covered in the polyamory toolkit, but like I said, in just a slightly different way because we're gonna use journaling to help us with these tools. For me, I'm an avid journaler, right? I journal all the time. My brain works so fast that I need to journal to get the squirrels to shut up. <laughs> You know, they need to know they're heard. They need to know that, that I'm listening to them. And if I write it out, it helps calm them down a little bit. So some of the benefits of journaling, I mean, this is literally manual mode on paper, right? Manual mode is one of my tools. It is about going quiet, even though I'm an external processor. It's about going quiet finding that logic and trying to line up the logic and the emotions, right? Because they're both there. They both need to be heard. But if I'm triggered and, and literally triggered, like out of control, emotionally can't think, it is because my logic and my emotions are not lined up. So in that quiet space, I can get them to the same spot. And that helps me figure stuff out. So literally manual mode on paper or digital, however you journal. So some of the benefits are reducing anxiety, breaking away from a nonstop cycle of obsessive thinking, that's me, helps with the monkey mind, gerbils, hamsters, squirrels, whatever you call them, helps me sleep better at night. There are times that I lay there awake and my brain just runs nonstop. And I have to get up and I will come out here still. I will come out here, I, my journal is digital at this point. I'll open up the database that I have and I would just pound out whatever is in my head. And a lot of times when I'm done and I can close the laptop, I can at least get to sleep because I know I don't have to think about it because I can come back and read it tomorrow. So it just kind of moves it from my head to a database so that I don't have to think about it. It helps with improving awareness and perception of things that are going on. If you get locked in your emotions, it's really hard to have that observer perception. I mean, if you can get to a point where you're here 
and, and maybe you are having emotional issues, but you can separate a little piece off that becomes the observer and looks at this without all the emotions. Maybe, maybe it's your logical piece or something. We just call it the observer. If you can get to that, sometimes you can really work with the emotions that you're having. It helps with regulating emotions, which is kind of what I'm talking about here, encourages that awareness, and it'll literally boost your physical health. It'll lower your blood pressure. It will, I mean, stress affects your bodies in a lot of ways. And if you can get to where you can calm down, it actually helps all that out. Okay. So how to journal. All right. I'm not going to give you a lot of rules. Basically, pick a time of day that works for you and then write how it suits you. There, there's, there's no real rules about how to do it. I usually write first thing in the morning because I like to log my dreams. My dreams are very important to me. There are times that I wake up from dreams and I have adrenaline going on or something like that. I can tell I wake up grumpy and something's happened in a dream. And I need to, to separate that from what's going on in my reality. So I log my dreams so that I know where those emotions are coming from. So I've been doing that for most of my whole life. My dreams are very intense. So I try to, try to separate them by putting them out on paper. So I journal first thing in the morning, unless I can't sleep at night, and then I'll come out here and journal at night. So if I'm trying to process something, I'll journal. But for the most part, I have a regular morning time that I do that at. Now, even though I'm not going to give you a lot of rules, I do have some recommendations. Okay. One is, is to take a breath and realize you're going into manual mode, right? The other is, and I have to work on this so much, but the other one is, is to process instead of log. What I end up doing is I become very logical when I go to journal. Today, I did this thing, and then I did this other thing, and then I did this other thing. And I don't really talk about the emotions behind it or how it made me feel. So I literally have to sit here. Now, old, old Dawn, when I was first on my healing path, it was all emotional. It was, it was, it was, it was, yes, it was very emotional. Now I'm kind of stuck in my logic brain. So I have to make the emotions come out and process stuff instead of saying, well, Dan and Karen went on a cruise today. I went out and got ice cream. It's Dan and Karen went out on a cruise today. How did that make me feel? Why did I go get ice cream? How did that make me feel? You know, things like that. So I, I really try to process instead of log. Start small if you need to. This doesn't have to be a huge project. Sometimes I can get on there and just write a couple of sentences, look at it and go, yep, I've got nothing else. I'll try again tomorrow. Don't worry about spelling or punctuation unless you're a little OCD with that and it's going to drive you crazy not to have good spelling and punctuation. No one else, at least this kind of journaling, no one else is going to be reading this. This is for you. Choose a medium that suits you. I used to do paper journals. I just burned all my paper journals when I went on the road because I didn't want my kids finding them in storage if something happened to me. <laughs> so my, my digital one doesn't have a password on it, but it clearly states Dawn's journal, sex might be revealed because if my kids come across that, I don't want, I've had people tell me, oh, you know, I say it's taxes or something like that. I'm like, no, no, no. My kids will open that. If it says mom's sex life, they will never look at it. <laughs> I don't want to have to worry about that. So I label things very clearly. Anyway, my, my digital version is what I have now. I burnt to the paper versions. I didn't need to go back and relive those emotions. But we used to have something called live journal. It's still out there. I have one person that I still get updates about. And that was, you can have people as friends and they can read your journal. And sometimes that's beneficial to us, sometimes not. 
right? I say more if it's private. So it can be paper, it can be a database. I use Obsidian right now, which is just a big database with all my stuff in it. Google Docs, Dropbox. I mean, there's so many options out there. There's apps, there's journal apps out there you can use, anything like that. I really like the paper version because I like to draw. And I actually used to have a drawing journal as well. So, I mean, there, it was no writing, it was all pictures. And even though I don't draw super well, it was really neat to get that stuff out there. So you can use all kinds of options. Accept your emotions as you write. You may become upset and that's okay. Sometimes I get frustrated when I get upset when I'm journaling because I think I should be beyond that. We're humans. So it, it's emotions are emotions. And then take a break if you need to. So those are your rules or recommendations for journaling. One, there are no rules, but some recommendations. So our book, Polyamory Toolkit, has at least 25 tools in there. And I pulled eight out to look at and have journal prompts for. So the very first tool that we talk about in the book is to develop your why. Why are you polyamorous? So that is your journal prompt. Anyone that comes into our polyamorous classes, I'm assuming are dealing with jealousy, are dealing with hard times, are dealing with just not being able to figure things out. So the journal prompts are going to kind of be around that. So this one is, why am I putting myself through these hard emotions, right? Why, why are you doing this? Is it worth it? That could be another journal prompt. Is it worth it? It's a question I've asked myself. I've done a lot of work. I've been through a lot of emotions. Is it worth the work? Why are you putting yourself through these emotions? Another one could be, how would I feel if I didn't live this way? Right? Another feeling journal prompt. So discover your why. I mean, people do polyamory for different reasons. For some people, it is because they are wired this way. They want to have relationships with more than one person. For me, I need to be in a relationship that allows for other relationships. So I need to be in a relationship where I can act on my emotions. I've got guidelines. I've got structure on how I do that. Not everybody does, right? It depends how you design your polyamory but I can act on emotions if emotions or tingles or whatever you want to call it, if they arise, I have a way to act on these and talk about them with my partner. For other people, they could be polyamorous or monogamous. Doesn't really matter to them. It's a, a style of living, not a need. So think about that. Why? Why are you putting yourself through this? Develop your why. So, like I said, mine is simple. It's because I cannot live a monogamous life. Tried it, don't like it. It's not how I'm wired. So, I do the work. The next one is literally, oh my God, there, there's, there's a couple on here that are already literally about journaling. So, this one is called draft email, right? Now, draft email is where our partner is usually when we write draft emails our partner is not there with us they are out on a date they are out on a vacation with another partner they are doing something with somebody else and all these emotions have arisen now when my emotions would arise during that time it would very much be things like why do they feel the need to go out with someone else? Aren't I enough? 
don't they think about me and what I need and how I want to spend time with them? And what about me? And, you know, he's such a dick because he can't be home when he knows I need him at home. And, you know, things like that, the, the stuff that we don't want to even be thinking, but it's just there. And those words are there. And with draft email, we would literally, now this is at the beginning. And remember that Dan and I came into this relationship, even though we were designing it to be this fantastical thing, we had no experience with that. We had no experience with communication skills, we, nothing like that. So we kind of made this stuff up as we went along to figure out what worked for us. And this draft email worked for us. And basically I would sit at the laptop because Dan found other people to date separately before I did. And I would sit at the laptop and I'd be so emotional and I would open up an email and it would be, I can't believe you're doing this. And I can't believe, you know, blah, blah, blah. And everything was like him, him, him. Make sure you don't put their name in the email address. You're not actually sending this while they're on a date. That's not the purpose. See, I did do that. That's why we came up with this tool so that I don't do that. So I can open that email and I can say anything that I want to say. And what we figured out was, is if we allowed ourselves to do that, that we would actually get to the point of what was really going on. So I externally process, and it usually takes me about a half hour of trying to figure out what's going on in my brain and trying to match it up with different things before I actually get through all the spaghetti and figure out the nugget of what's going on. By doing the draft email, by doing the journaling, this helps me process that so that I can get to the nugget. So with this draft email, we would just type and type and type and I would call them names and, you know, I can't believe you're doing this and just trying to get all that emotions out. And then at some point it would start to calm down and I would be like, oh, yeah, I'm scared. I'm scared you're going to like them more than me and you're going to leave me. And that's what all of this is about pages, <laughs> pages of me ranting to get to that piece. And by using that as a tool, I was able to get those emails to be smaller and smaller and smaller to where I didn't need them anymore. Now, when he came home, he would ask me, do you have a draft email? And I'd be like, yeah, I do, but I don't know that I want to share it with you. And he's like, well, let me see what was going on in your head so that I can come from a place of assistance and see if I can help you. And I would show him that email and then I would have to wait a little bit for him to respond because there'd be some crappy stuff in there. And over time, he would come home and go, so do you have a draft email? I'd be like, I started one, but I figured it out myself. So I'm, I'm good. And then over time, it's like, do you have a draft email? No, nope. I'm fine. So it was just one of those tools that helped us. So if you decide to use draft email, your partner has to remember that you're really not attacking them. Even though all those words sound like you're attacking them, you're really trying to get through those emotions to figure out what the real emotion is. For me, I don't know how to label my emotions. I never learned how to label that angst that was going on. So it takes me a while to get through that crap to get to what's going on. So the, the journal prompt is, what are the hard feelings I'm having? Right? You may have to get a feeling wheel. They have stickers that are feeling wheels or um, emotional wheels, you may have to Google that to get the list of all the emotions because there's a lot that feel kind of the same and to try to weed through that. But yeah, what are the hard feelings that I'm having? The next one is more fun. So this is your joy journal, okay? So this is literally a journal that I created because I am such an avid journaler and I would go back to those written journals and reread stuff and I'd be like holy cow I'm a basket case and I would go to Dan and I'm like why why what look at all this crap I go through 
And he's like, have you looked at the dates on that? Those started out like weekly and then monthly and then every quarterly, you know, you don't post this. You don't write about this stuff every day anymore. Like you used to, you've made such progress. And I'm like, but I put you through all of this. And I'm like, you know, it almost feels like my focus is on finding the bad crap so that I have something to write about. He's like, well, work with that. And I'm like, hmm, okay, more work. So what I figured out was, was to create a joy journal. And literally it is about shifting the focus of how you look at your day and what happens to you. And I literally just learned this in the hypnosis thing that I'm doing. It's called RAS, Reticular Activation System. And the example that they use with this training that I'm taking, and if you go to buy a new car, let's say I bought a Kia, and I never saw a Kia on the road before, but now I've bought it, and I'm seeing them all over the place, right? I'm down here in Southern Arizona, and I'm seeing my old truck everywhere, and it's because my focus is on that. I loved that truck. And I saw one of those on the road here. And I'm like, oh, that's my old truck. And now I see them everywhere. I don't even see the other cars. And it's because that's what my brain is now looking for. So with the joy journal, it's the same thing. Instead of looking for all the negative stuff to journal about and process, like we do, look for the joyous stuff. And that changed my thinking to where I was finding joy all the time and when you can find the joy it's so much easier to feel compersion so your journal prompt for the joy journal is what joy do I find in polyamory for me it was when one of the first things I wrote in that journal and I literally had a pink leather bound written journal that I could carry with me so that anytime something peaked its head up that was compersion or joy I could write it in this journal and the first thing I wrote in there was um, my current partner's got three kids they know about his polyamorous life because he's been polyamorous his whole adult life I came on board and the oldest one isn't really into polyamory because he's seen his parents get hurt the middle one was kind of Eh, about polyamory he could take it or leave it the youngest one was like oh yeah this is my whole life you know great welcome to the family sort of thing so the oldest one was kind of resistant not rude at all he was very gracious but eh, didn't wasn't really his thing but he got married and had a baby and I'm over at their house and he comes to me with this little itty bitty child and he's like, would you like to hold my son? And I'm like, oh, he trusts me with, yes, indeed, I would love to do that. And that was one of the first joys because I knew how resistant he was with having me there. So that was just kind of, that was awesome. That was the first thing in my joy journal. And when that happened and I wrote that first thing down, then I started finding more things and more things and polyamory started to excite me and I started looking for those things so joy journal what joy do you find in polyamory right it, it works hand in hand with the why am I putting myself through the hard times there's got to be some joy in there otherwise why are you doing this so find those find those pieces even if they're small to start with okay so the other one so this one I really worked on this in my joy journal this one's called other person's shoes and it's a little different than how you usually think about other person's shoes but I that's what stuck in my head I never came up with another name for it so other person's shoes um like I said big d uh that's my other partner his wife taught me this without knowing she was teaching me this so me and big d Hadn't been able to spend time together. I was over at their house. Our anniversary was coming up and we decided, Big D and I, we decided that
that we were going to go get a cabin in Hocking Hills and spend the weekend together and do some hiking and some other stuff and really spend a good weekend together. And we went back to his house to tell his wife and I kind of hid behind him because I knew how I reacted. But Dan told me he was going to do a, a vacation or something with one of his partners. And I didn't want that backlash. And her response was, oh, my God, you guys don't get to spend time together. I hope you have a great time. And I was like, what? Wait, people respond like that? I'm not used to this. And, you know, but she was like, where are you going? What are you going to do? Oh, how cool. You're going to have a cave in your backyard of the Airbnb. Don't forget this hike. Don't forget this restaurant, all these things. And she was just so supportive and genuinely happy that her husband was going out with me. Right. I mean, she is a compersion fool. She's, <laughs> you know, she, she's got that self-confidence in herself and just, uh, just, it just really shows through. So I decided that's how I wanted to respond to Dan when he brought stuff home to me. Or I realized that's how I wanted him to respond when I went home to tell him that I was going on a weekend vacation. Right. I mean, I, I knew he was going to be OK because it's Dan, but I really wanted to have that reaction of. Oh, honey, I'm great. I'm, I'm so happy for you. I'm glad you get to go do this thing. And I'm like, ooh, Dan probably wishes I reacted like that anytime he came home with news like that. Instead of going, crap, I just planned this thing with my partner and now I have to go home and tell Dawn. And great, there's going to be more work to do. Yay. <laughs> so I started flipping my thinking and it works hand in hand would change the story which is another tool that I actually didn't put in this class it kind of works with that in that instead of Dan telling me he's going to go on a trip with a partner or going to go up to Phoenix and spend the weekend with one of his new partners instead of me going you know what about me or you know I would like to have that weekend whatever it is that goes through your head I'm at the point right now that it's even hard for me to come up with examples of how I used to think because I've turned that corner and it's kind of like a ratchet, right? When you use a ratchet, it goes forward, but it never goes back completely the whole way. It's always forward a little bit, back a little bit, forward more, back more. So it's hard for me to remember those examples and those emotions, but this has been a huge tool for me. She was such a, an amazing and still is an amazing influence on my polyamory journey. So your journal prompt for this is how would I want my partners to react when I tell them something that I find exciting? And you can flip it and go how how should isn't the right word, but how would I like to react? Because I want to be happy for Dan. I want to provide that environment for him, right? I don't want him to have to come home and do work with me again because I've had a reaction, right? So anyway, you are wherever you are in your journey. Just know that I was a mess, <laughs> at the beginning trying to figure this out and I've gotten to a point to where his two partners that he has now I I enjoy them I love their company I love doing things with them we Marco Polo all the time we nurture this friendship and I didn't have that at the beginning okay so that's other person's shoes how would I want my partners to react when I tell them something that I find exciting so then we have the mantra, okay? So the mantra, this was very powerful for me at the beginning as well, and I didn't know I was doing this, okay? So this is one of those things that maybe I picked it up from somewhere. I mean, we've picked up some of these tools on our spiritual journey, our, our recovery journey, our healing journey. Some stuff just popped into our heads and we made up words for um, I'm sure you've heard of the word mantra, 
right? It's like a positive affirmation. Mine's a little different in that I was having a really hard time one night. I mean, I was triggered. I was crying. I was angry. I was all those things. I was driving, which is bad. I was driving the loop around Columbus. And yeah, you really shouldn't be on the road when you're this angry and crying and things like that. But that's what, that's what I did. I'm driving and I'm, I'm yelling and I'm beating on the steering wheel and thank goodness no one cut me off because I probably would have chased them down. Right. You know, just that sort of angst and anger. And um, I'm yelling and I'm, I'm telling myself this story out loud and I'm trying to calm myself down because I, I need to calm down. I'm driving and I'm trying to flip my thinking and I ended up going, you know what, this is, I know this hurts. I know this is a past feeling. I know this isn't a current feeling. I know this is not actually what he's doing that's making me feel like this. It's reminding me of something else, someone else, blah, blah, blah. And it's like, okay, Dawn, so what do you know about Dan? You know, you know, Dan loves you. You have trust in him. You have trust in your relationship. You have trust in what you've built. You love him. You want to make this work. You have faith that all this stuff is going to work out. And I, you know, my brain works a lot faster than that. My mouth works a lot faster than that when I'm clued into that brain, right? But it got to a point where I was able to like remove all those words and just come down to love, trust, faith. And I needed to do that because I was out of control and I needed something that I could recite. Love, trust, faith, love, trust, faith. And that ended up calming me down to where I could get to a moment of, Dawn, you need to pull over the car and maybe call Dan to come and get you. <laughs> this, is, this is how this is going to have to work. And luckily, we figured out that whole place of assistance thing. So if I say, hey, I need you to come assist me, you know, I'm having a meltdown. He knows what that means. But that, I mean, I can, do I still use that mantra? I can't think of, God, I need to knock on wood a lot. Don't jinx this. But I can't think of anything. I haven't had to use this in a long time. But man, it was, it was phenomenal when I finally figured it out. I would feel, so with me, when I get triggered, it's a very physical feeling. Do I actually talk about this? Yes, I do. So I will talk about this for the journal prompt, but it's a physical feeling. So I know when it's a trigger versus just a emotional whatever. I'll talk about that in a little bit. So your journal prompt after hearing my story, what are three words that I know to be true about my relationship? Now, whatever relationship you're having issues with or feeling a little wonky with, right? So mine is love, trust, faith for my relationship with Dan. But I also have faith that polyamory is the right path for me. So love, trust, faith could be about polyamory itself, not just my connection with a person. Okay. All right, so the next one is a working journal. Now, in the book, I don't remember if I called it a compersion journal or a working journal. I think of it as a working journal, all right? So I talked about the joy journal, which is one thing. And then there's the working journal, which is another thing. The working journal actually came first, all right? So the working journal is... um me trying to figure out how to take care of me when Dan is gone. So we started dating separately. Dan already had Karen. I was not having luck finding anybody else. So me and her husband at the time didn't work out as a couple. So it's like, what do I do with my time when Dan's gone? Yes, I'm an introvert, but... Mm, I don't like to be alone, or at least I didn't like to be alone when he was out with someone else. It would put me in a dark spiral. And he'd be like, well, play the video game that we play together so that you can get better at it and beat me. 
And what I found was, is that I'd be playing the video game and I'd be crying because my thought was the only reason I'm sitting here playing alone is because Dan's out with someone else, right? So what I started doing was figuring out what did work, right? I tried playing video games. That didn't work. I pitied myself. Okay, so that didn't work. The next time Dan went out, I went out with my friends who are all vanilla and they knew Dan was out with someone else. And they kind of like told me, of course you're feeling bad. Your husband's out with someone else, which is not what I wanted to hear. So that didn't work. So another time I went out with polyamorous friends and they're like, oh, I felt that way before. It'll be all right. You guys will figure this out. Oh, that works. Right. So just keeping track of of what works and what doesn't work. And sometimes that changes. Right. So what I do now. Oh, my God. So I used to cry and wonder when he'd be home and wonder why I'm alone and things like that at the beginning. And now it's like, so when are you going for the weekend? Because I've got a little bit of extra money and I want to go hit the casino. And I know you don't like the casino. When you go in, go. He needs to go out with people that don't have food allergies. So. You know, I can feel that for him now and be perfectly fine being home by myself, sleeping my own hours, watching my own TV shows. So that that really works for me now. I know he's coming home. I know he's going to have a good time. That's the working journal. Your journal prompt is what works for me when my partner is with his other partner and I'm having a difficult time. What things should I try? So what works for me when my partner is with his other partner and I'm having a difficult time? What things are on your bucket list that you would like to try that you don't need them along with, right? So yeah, I've got things, things like that as well. I go to the casino, I go get massages, I go do all those personal care things. And I have changed the story, like I said, another tool. I changed the story to be, I am doing this for me and not, I'm doing this because he left me. <laughs> so I have to change that. I know we're running out of time, but I'm going to cover these last two. So the next one is and, not, or. Okay. So yes, this was a big one for me in that. Our other relationships are ands, not the monogamous thinking of or, which means if he loves this person, he's not going to love me anymore. You can love more than one, right? You would think that's obvious when you're polyamorous, but we most of us have been brought up with the monogamous thinking and thinking, ah, uh, crap. Well, if he likes her, he doesn't like me anymore. And this clicked for me. I mean, logically, I'm like, I know it's an and. I know this. But it wasn't until I actually fell in love with my boyfriend at the time and realized I had not fallen out of love with Dan that it actually clicked for me emotionally I felt that instead of logically I mean I had felt that before with a boyfriend in high school and stuff like that but with Dan I had never felt that and that was that was a clicker for me okay so and not or he can date me and another person I can be with him and another person so more is good in this and not or so Two journal prompts. One of them is, where does my thinking come from that I believe I'm going to be replaced? And it can be as simple as, what is my fear? Because that's usually what this boils down to is fear, right? With Dan, I had found someone that I matched so perfectly with that I had a fear of losing that right? I feel good when I'm with him and I didn't want to lose that. All right. So where does my thinking come from that I believe I'm going to be replaced? The other one is how can I build confidence 
that they want me and the other person? How can I build that consonance and that knowing that they want both of us? So there's your and and your or for that, for that tool. Last one. I wanted to make sure I put this one in here. And I don't know how many other people have triggers. And when I talk triggers, I'm not talking a feeling of uncomfortableness. I'm talking about that emotionally out of control because we're stuck in something that happened to us in the past or a huge fear of something in the future, okay? And that usually means logic goes right out the window. We're all emotional at that point, okay? When I am in a triggered moment, and they happened a lot at the beginning because I, I did have a lot of fears and I had just, yay me, when Dan and I got together, I was starting my power exchange journey my polyamorous journey, my kink journey, my discovery of self journey, and my healing journey. Because when I started all these, it dropped my shields around me, my walls around me. So I had to deal with my past. So all this stuff got very confused together, which is, which is how a lot of these tools came into place. So with Wham, what I figured out was with the triggers, when I would get lost in a trigger, I started really paying attention to what was going on. And one of the things, the reason we call this a wham moment is because the phrase going through my head was, what about me? I felt like Dan was being very selfish. I didn't feel like he was putting me first. So the phrase that would go through my head was, what about me? And I started realizing that when I was in those moments that I was actually verbally saying that, well, what about me? You're going on a cruise? Well, what about me? You're, you're going to go do this thing? Well, what about me? And it felt very selfish on my part, but those are the words that were coming out of my mouth. Those are the words that were in my head. And we started realizing, whoa, that is part of my signal that I am not in the present moment. I am dredging something up or I'm lost in a fear. Okay, so we started calling these wham moments. Dan has wham moments as well. He's never been jealous over me and me dating other people until I fell in love with Big D. Now, the guy I fell in love with before Big D, for some reason, that didn't really bother Dan. I think he know, knew that wasn't going to work out. But when I fell in love with Big D, that was huge for him. And when I start talking about how Big D can drive in the snow and things like that. Dan takes that personally. Like I'm telling him he can't drive worth shit. And the phrase that goes through his head is, what about me? And he's like, whoa, that's what she feels like. Okay, so, you know, it's kind of cool when he can feel some of the things that I went through. I don't wish it on anybody, but at least now he understands. So wham. Now, the other thing that I find when I have wham moments is that there's also a body reaction. When I have that trigger, I have learned that I get a feeling in the pit of my stomach. And it just feels like this knotted up spot in the pit of my stomach. And what I've learned is that when I have blips, when I have wham moments, when I have something that gets me to start as an emotional reaction, that physical reaction happens first. So when I feel that, I'm like, oh, I can, I can be proactive with what's getting ready to happen. If Dan tells me something now, he's, he's like, so how are you doing? And I have to sit there and I check in with my body and I go, okay, either I'm not feeling anything or my walls are up. So give me a few moments to see what's going on in my body and then I'll, I'll let you know. So I really do a check-in. Okay. So journal prompt, where do I feel it in my body when I'm triggered? Now, if you don't have the kind of triggers that I'm talking about, um, I'm betting that whenever you feel uncomfortable in a situation, 
right? There's a difference between uncomfortable and triggered. So if you don't get to this, not everybody gets to this moment. Not all of us had trauma in our past that, that gets brought up. So if you just get to a place of feeling uncomfortable or feeling resistant, feel that in your body and see where it is so that you can start to be proactive because that will usually happen before the emotional reaction, okay? So where do I feel it in my body when I get triggered or uncomfortable? Is there a phrase that goes through my head? And sometimes it'll just be, like I said, just a couple of words of something. And it could be very different than mine. Where do I feel it in my body? What does a blip or a hiccup or a whatever feel like? Someone's told you something and you went, oh, that hit wrong. What is that? What does that feel like? I love being able to be proactive about this now. I mean, it just used to just smack me in the face and then I'm a mess for, well, it used to be weeks. <laughs> now I can go, oh, that was a blip. What the hell was that? Okay. And then I get to look at it, right? Growth along the journey. Okay, so those were eight poly tools and some journal prompts to work with those. And I may put another class together that's got more of the tools. I kind of like that one. So everything we do, including the last 16 recorded classes, can be found on eroticawakening.com. If you go to classes on demand, that's all of our classes that I've edited and uploaded. There's more poly ones on there. There's some power exchange, some sacred sexuality, things like that. If you go to the website, you can sign up for the newsletter. 